further evidence that what we're looking at in the smoke juices is actually our, our glycol glycoside. When we have a look at the fragmentation pattern of these juice components, we can see that they exactly match that of our reference glycol glycoside. So we see the same 285, 161 and 123 fragment in both of those juice samples. Now we wanted to have a look at the hydrolytic behaviour of the glycol glucoside um, during hydrolysis. And so we treated a solution of the glucoside and each of our juice samples with the same strong acid hydrolysis or beta-glucosidase enzyme hydrolysis conditions that we used previously. We can see here the trace of um, just our, our samples before we treated them, um, the glycol glycoside present in each of the samples. What was really interesting to us was when we applied the strong acid hydrolysis conditions in each of these samples, the glycol glycoside is still there. It hasn't, it hasn't been affected by this strong acid hydrolysis conditions. And if you just have a look at the, the intensity rating on the side here, you can see that in each case they're actually the same. So it's not a case of they've partially degraded. These compounds are still, still there unaffected. So that was quite an interesting result and has some quite important implications for the previous hydrolysis work that we did, which I'll come back to that. But what we did observe was when we treated these compounds or these samples with beta-glucosidase enzyme, in each of these samples the glycoside's almost been completely degraded. So um, now again if you have a look at the intensity rating you can see that this is, this is right down compared to what we saw up here. So the glycol glycoside is being hydrolyzed by beta-glucosidase enzyme. Okay so the implications, firstly we've finally been able to prove the provenance of beta glucopyranoside precursor in smoke affected grapes for the first time um, and this is the first plausible explanation for why we see an intensification of smoke aroma during, um, during fermentation. Release glycol under enzymatic conditions um, but the glucoside survived strong acid hydrolysis conditions. I haven't actually shown it but we also went through and analysed each of those hydrolysate samples by GCMS to have a look at the release of, of glycol but I haven't shown that data. But this is the, the key thing, the, the fact that the glucoside is resilient towards strong acid hydrolysis means that in the previous experiments we did, whatever we were liberating, um, when we were li liberating the glycol, it wasn't derived from the glycoside. So this suggests to me that there are actually multiple precursors and this is what, what Con alluded to in the talk, there might be precursors to precursors. Um, and, and this is something that we certainly need to conduct further work on. It also has important implications for sample preparation for the assessment of smoke taint, tainted juice and, and wine samples. So we would recommend that um, anybody who wants to have their, their juice samples analysed to, to quantify glycol needs to actually treat their sample first with enzyme hydrolysis conditions to make sure that they're actually liberating any of these precursors you probably could use strong acid hydrolysis conditions. Certainly in the previous experiment, we liberated large amounts of all the volatile phenols, but we suspect that they're probably, this process is more complicated and that these conditions more than likely um, also catalyze other degradation reactions. So it's possible that you might liberate glycol, but you might also then degrade some of that glycol as you, as you turn it into other things. So we can't really control that process. So enzyme hydrolysis is probably the safer option or a more reliable option. In terms of future directions, um, Kerry is currently working on the synthesis of glucoside derivatives of the other smoke taint volatile phenols. So we're still interested in seeing are the glucosides of 4-methylglycol, 4-ethylglycol and 4-ethylphenol present. But most importantly, she's working on the synthesis of an isotopically labelled version of the phenol glucoside that we can use as an internal standard. We hope to develop, um, with the help of AWRI, a quantitative LCMS tandem mass spectrometry method so we can actually get hold of juice and grape and wine samples and actually quantify this glycol glucoside. Once we do that, what we'd like to be able to do is monitor both the phenol and glucoside, or the glycol and the glucoside, concentrations in grapes and grapevines and leaves to try and un start to understand the biochemistry that's taking place and to be able to investigate this glycosylation process that's taking place in a grapevine, where is it happening, how long does it take after smoke exposure to take place, um, can we see 
um, glycol being absorbed by leaves, being glycosylated and then translocated into the berries um, it, to try and get a handle on the biochemistry that's taking place. We're also working um, with AWRI to try to isolate and identify what these other precursor compounds are because based on our, our previous hydrolysis experiments there must be a few of them and they must um, account for you know, a fair proportion of the bound glycol or bound phenols that are present. So I hope to isolate them and, and work out, elucidate their structures. Again, once we've investigated what these compounds are, we can try to establish quantitative methods to be able to measure them and again, come back and have a look at the biochemistry taking place in the grapevine. <coughs> and then another area we're interested in, in working in is in um, it's all well and good to have these precursors, but how are they breaking down during um, the fermentation process, both alcoholic or primary and malolactic fermentation. So then we, once we understand how these compounds behave, then we can try and help identify winemaking practices that might be able to manipulate some of these compounds so that we can either liberate all of them and then subsequently treat the wine with reverse osmosis or we can try not to liberate any of them and you know, monitor what happens during um, bottle maturation with time, are they, are they later released or not. Um, I'll just acknowledge um, Kristen Kennison who conducted all of the fermentation experiments um, staff at the AWRI, Yoji Hayasaka in particular, who's done all the LCMS work and who we've relied on quite heavily, and then Kerry Dungy, who's um, conducted all the glycol glucoside synthesis. Thank you.